I'm Lori Gruen, professor of philosophy at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, where I am the founder and coordinator of Wesleyan Animal Studies. I specialize in animal ethics, animal studies, feminist philosophy, and philosophy of law. I'm the author and editor of a dozen books on animal-related topics. I've been interested in animals since I was quite young, but I really got introduced to animal ethics in a philosophy class in college. And I was learning primarily about the ways that animals are treated on factory farms, and I was stunned. So I took a break between undergraduate and graduate work to work with the animal protection movement in the exciting early days. At the time, I worked primarily on uncovering the ways that animals were suffering in laboratories. But I also worked with homeless women and housing insecure women who wouldn't go to shelters because at the time those shelters weren't taking cats and dogs. So ultimately these women would end up in dangerous situations because they didn't want to leave their animals. In this presentation, I'm going to be discussing the intersection of animal ethics and animal law, highlighting how animal ethics can undergird much of the work in animal law. My presentation has three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about what I call questions of normativity. That is, different frameworks for figuring, figuring out right and wrong. In the second part, I'm going to talk about moral standing and its connections to legal standing. In the final part, I'm going to present a number of different ethical theories that provide methods that guide our actions and our policies. Ethics means different things to different people in different contexts. And as, as an ethicist, I see it as a system for explaining and justifying values and the actions that spring from those values. Ethics is one type of normative system. The law is another. Religion is another. By normative system, I mean a system of values, a system of judgment, a system of assessment, as opposed to a descriptive system, which is meant to tell us about facts. Let's look at a few normative frameworks and get a sense of how they help us navigate our worlds by exploring first, appraisal terms for each of the frameworks, second, the sources for these appraisal terms, and third, what sanctions might arise for violating the norms of each framework, both internal sanctions, sanctions about how we feel when we violate a norm, and external frameworks, frameworks about how the world responds to us when we violate the norm. So let's start with appraisal terms for ethics. As I've already suggested, that's good or bad, right or wrong, praiseworthy or blameworthy. The sources of these appraisal terms are arguments that we can make that provide us with reasons. And these are reasons that go beyond our personal opinions, reasons that we can share with others. A lot of times people think of ethical as being personal opinions. But I think it's important to see that ethics and the appraisal terms we use in ethics are important for going beyond our personal views. When we provide arguments, we're also often expressing types of sensitivities to the well-being of others. And ultimately, when we're thinking about good or bad or right and wrong in ethical terms, what we're ultimately trying to do is convince others about what would be good or bad to promote the well-being of another. Now, when we violate these ethical norms, there are different kinds of sanctions. What are the sanctions for violating ethical demands or ethical norms? Well, internally, we might feel shame or regret. Externally, we might be socially condemned, maybe even protested against. What are the appraisal terms for law? These are different from right, wrong, good, bad, blameworthy, praiseworthy. What we have here are things like legal, illegal, or criminal. The source of these appraisal terms or these norms also come from arguments like ethics, but the arguments are made in the case of law are predicated on certain rulings or laws that are made by Congress, courts. We might appeal to the Constitution. There may be legal cases that will help us to see what the source of these appraisal terms are, and also we might appeal to precedent. When we violate these kinds of legal norms, internally, again, we might feel shame, we might feel remorse. Externally, we're familiar with violations of 
criminal code or legal law, and that is we have external fines, prison, and other forms of punishment. The appraisal terms for religion are familiar in thinking about someone being holy or virtuous or somebody being sinful, wicked, or evil. And the source of these kinds of judgments or appraisal terms are different from both ethics and law. Here we have the church or revelation or religious texts or the commandments of our imam or rabbi or pastor or priest. When we violate religious norms, there are different kinds of sanctions. Internally, we might feel guilt. We might feel fear. Externally, we might be excommunicated, we might be shunned, and sometimes it's much worse, we might face eternal damnation. The appraisal terms for etiquette um, are different still, and etiquette is a quite different kind of normative system, but I wanted to highlight etiquette as one of the systems to help sort of familiarize us with the whole framework of normative systems. So the appraisal terms for etiquette are proper, improper, uncouth, and rude. The sources might be mismanners or certain ethical codes that you learn maybe in business school or in charm school. And the sanctions are, are really quite different. The sanctions are usually internally you would feel embarrassed, externally you might feel scorn from others, or you might be scolded. Um, an example I like to think of about etiquette that's completely different from law and ethics and religion is not picking up after your dog on a dog walk. This is a really clear example of a violation of a etiquette norm, but you're not going to be judged as a bad person and you're not going to be fined, usually, depending on the jurisdiction, of course, and religion doesn't really have much to say about whether or not you pick up after your dog. The final normative system that I just wanted to uh, highlight is what we might call aesthetics. And here the appraisal terms are beautiful and ugly. The source of aesthetic appraisal tends to be taste. Cultural critics and experts are also good sources of figuring out what makes a particular object uh, beautiful or ugly. And the sanctions here are usually self-doubt. That's the internal sanction. The external sanction is that people might avoid you or reject you um, or make a, a judgment about perhaps your sort of lack of taste or lack of style. Now, I, I included aesthetics here because I think it's really important to distinguish aesthetics from ethics. Ethics tends to be much bigger than our own views, whereas aesthetics can be bigger than our own views. But ultimately, if you don't like something, because you don't find it beautiful, that's fine. It's up to you. Whereas if you don't like something, but it is ethical, it's not really up to you. And that's the main point of thinking about some of these normative systems. I'd like to give an example of how to think about an animal, in particular a rat, under each of these systems and how we might think about the way that the rat is understood or seen through these normative frameworks. So from the point of view of ethics, we might say that rats matter morally. And throughout the course of my presentation, I will hopefully convince you that that would be a good thing to be thinking about. In the law, rats are not even noticed. In fact, rats are one of the most commonly used animals in research and are not even covered under the Animal Welfare Act, the law that governs welfare of animals in this country. So they're not even considered animals under the law. In the religious normative framework, rats are often linked to evil or associated with plagues. Um, they are the kinds of things that we should avoid or do away with. And in a framework that focuses on etiquette, rats are generally thought to be dirty pests and they should be exterminated. Aesthetics, the final normative framework that I was indicating, again, it's rats tend to be looked at as ugly and beings that we should uh, avoid or not pay much attention to. When we think about rats under uh, the aesthetic normative framework, we generally tend to think that rats are gross or ugly and should be avoided. But many people think of rats as adorable and they make terrific pets. There's even rat rescues that um, make it seem that rats are just the smartest, cutest creatures you could imagine. 
Before we end the section, I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship of ethics and law. So some actions are ethical, but not legal. And some actions are legal, but not ethical. Fortunately, most of the time, actions or policies that are ethical are in fact legal and vice versa. Let me give you a few examples. In some jurisdictions, the use of medical marijuana for pain control is not always legal, but of course it could be considered ethical. Or think about border crossing. Many people are fleeing conditions of real unsafety um, in order to come to, let's say, the United States to be safe and to be healthy. This could be considered ethical, but it's not always considered legal. Now, there's some actions like torture and some forms of imprisonment that are thought to be legal, but they're not always ethical. And using animals for various purposes is most of the time legal, but also not always ethical. So what is ethical and what is legal can come apart. And the differences in the normative frameworks that I've just highlighted helps us to see some of the reasons how that can be the case. Now with an understanding of the normative landscape, so to speak, under our belt, let's turn to moral standing and moral status. In the law, all humans have legal standing and are considered persons, but no non-human animals are currently considered legal persons. There's a difference in philosophy. In ethics, the term person has a very different meaning than it does under the law. Persons are thought to have certain capacities. The class of persons, those who are considered persons, is not identical to the class that are considered humans. In animal ethics, the questions of moral status or moral standing focus on moving beyond anthropocentrism. What is anthropocentrism? Anthropocentrism is the idea that humans are at the center of the moral universe, as it were. And there are two different versions, a strong version and a weaker version. The strong version of anthropocentrism says that only humans matter. It's a form of human supremacism. The weaker version of anthropocentrism says that other animals could matter, but only if they share certain capacities with humans, the humans at the center. So what might those capacities be? Decades ago, one of the capacities that was proposed was that what separates humans from other animals is tool use. Humans use tools and animals don't use tools. But it turns out humans and animals both use tools. So chimpanzees, it was discovered by Jane Goodall, use sticks to develop little fishing rods. They, they take the stick and remove all the little branches and find the perfect one to stick into a termite mound. And the termites crawl onto the stick and they pull the stick out pull the stick across their mouth and get the protein from the termites. So it turns out these chimps are using tools. So maybe they can count as persons. The fact that chimpanzees could use tools created quite a stir and made many think that maybe we needed to redefine what it means to be human. As it turns out, lots of different kinds of animals use lots of different kinds of tools. Uh, we know from uh, primatologist Jill Preetz, who studies the savannah chimpanzees, that they develop spears to hunt. We also know from research both in the wild and in laboratories that New Caledonian crows are really adept at developing tools. In one lab study, for example, they used paper clips that they would fashion into hooks and put the hooks in their beaks and use the hook to capture a little bucket that contained food. So it turns out many non-human animals can use tools. Tool use might be a capacity that was thought to distinguish humans from non-humans, but probably isn't the one that's going to work. What might be another capacity? Language use. Language use is the kind of thing that humans do that no other animals do, right? Well, not so much. One of the chimpanzees named Washo was taught human sign language, and she ended up teaching that human sign language to her offspring. In fact, there was a whole group 
of chimpanzees that she lived with that only communicated in sign language. And they communicated with humans in sign language as well. And it wasn't just the signs that they were taught. Washa was able to create new words. For example, there was a swan that she saw floating on a pond at one point, and she signed water bird to describe the swan. Kanzi is a bonobo who has used human language. He both understands human language and uses a computer board to express his own thoughts through language. But Kanzi is so good at understanding human language that he can be asked by the researcher who trained him, um, Sue Savage Rumba, to do fairly odd things. And he would nonetheless know what to do. So for example, at one point, she told Kanzi to put ketchup on a basketball. Who puts ketchup on a basketball? He probably never heard that sentence before and decided to go ahead and put the ketchup on the basketball. At another point, he was asked to put the shoes in a refrigerator. Who puts shoes in a refrigerator? Well, Kanzi, being a good bonobo, took the shoes, put them in the refrigerator. But it's not just great apes who've used language. In a set of experiments done um, by Irene Pepperberg with parrots, gray parrots, she was able to teach the parrots all sorts of words. And they were able to describe substance, number, and color. In one case, she was able to show the number four made out of cork to Alex, the gray parrot. And she said, what is this? And he responded, cork. Um, when she asked about the number, he said, four. So in some sense, all sorts of other animals are able to use human language. Of course, this is human language. So they have to be taught human language, just like human children have to be taught human language. Animals communicate amongst themselves and probably convey all sorts of information um, that we are unable to understand. But language itself is not a capacity that distinguishes all humans from all other animals. Might there be another capacity that would exclude all animals and include all humans? Another capacity that's been proposed is called theory of mind. Theory of mind is a fairly complex set of cognitive capacities that basically means that an individual can understand that someone else has different thoughts and different beliefs and different feelings than they have. And Sarah, chimpanzee, was sort of the star of early research on theory of mind. Sarah, a friend of mine who recently passed away, was presented with a videotape of a human who was facing a problem. And she was shown the videotape and then presented with two photographs, one of which contained the solution to the problem. For example, there might have been a human who had a can of soup and he was standing in front of a stove that had a pan on the stove. And he was trying to figure out a way to open the can. The video stops and Sarah was presented with two photographs, one of a can opener and the other of a fire extinguisher. And more times than chance, so chance being 50%, over 50% of the time, often around 80% of the time, Sarah would pick the solution to the problem that the human was facing. And that led many to think that she had a theory of mind. She wasn't facing that, that problem. Someone else was facing that problem. And she was able to figure out what that other person needed to solve the problem. So that meant that she understood that what was in her mind was different than what was in the mind of another. That's what theory of mind is. So perhaps other animals have theories of mind. Might there be another capacity that distinguishes all humans from all animals? Some have suggested ethical engagement or empathy or care is one of the kinds of capacities that only humans engage in, only humans have, that other animals don't. But here, I'm going to bring in our friends, the rats, who are actually known to be quite caring, quite empathetic. In a set of lab experiments, lab experiments that I myself don't find ethical, but I'm going to convey nonetheless, a group of rats 
were placed in a situation in which one rat was free and another rat was held in a plexiglass or clear tube. The free rat could have gone and gotten some chocolate chip treats. But instead, in this situation, the rats most of the time free the rat who's in the tube so the two of them can go and partake in the treats. This is surprising not just to me, but surprising also to the experimenters who had devised this particular experiment. The idea that other animals share certain capacities with us have been used in legal cases to try to grant personhood status to other animals. For example, the Non-Human Rights Project is trying to argue that Happy, an elephant who is living alone at the Bronx Zoo, deserves to be freed to go to sanctuary because she is a person. That is, she has intelligence and autonomy and other capacities that are shared by humans. Focusing on similarities to humans creates hierarchies of worth. Sometimes humans with certain kinds of higher order capacities will be higher than some humans who are neuroatypical. And certain animals like the chimpanzee, elephants, dolphins maybe, will be higher than other animals like the rat. Instead of having these kinds of hierarchies where some are thought to be more valuable than others, we could embrace difference. Consider the octopus. Octopus are so different than most other animals and certainly different than humans. They have their neurological system distributed throughout their body, very different than we are. Some have even suggested that there is a whole different track of evolution that octopus went down. But they're very interesting creatures. They value their lives. They're curious. They even form relationships, even though they're primarily solitary animals. If we could embrace differences, we would be able to recognize and value animals as their own types of beings with their own types of dignity. So rather than focusing on the ways in which animals are similar to us, the weak anthropocentrism or the strong anthropocentrism, I would suggest that we try to do away with anthropocentrism and value animals for the profound and wonderful beings that they are. There are a number of ethical theories that we can draw on to guide our actions and shape our policies. The first is utilitarianism. This is the theory that Peter Singer made quite popular in his famous book, Animal Liberation, published in 1975. This is a book that has been thought to be the book that started the animal movement. And utilitarianism is a very central view within animal activism generally. Utilitarians are interested in maximizing happiness or pleasure and minimizing pain, all things considered. What that means is what they try to do is take everyone who's affected by a particular action and decide how much pleasure is produced by that action, how much pain is produced by that action, add them together and come up with a recommendation based on that action that's going to lead to the most pleasure over pain. And of course, since animals experience pain, it would be prejudicial to exclude their suffering from the moral calculus. So part of what happens in a utilitarian calculus is the decision is made based on everyone, not just humans, but humans and other animals who are affected by the action. So one of the strengths of utilitarian theory is it focuses our attention on suffering no matter who is suffering. So it's a very strong welfareist view. Anybody who can suffer, their suffering matters. The weakness of the view is also embedded in this strength, no matter who's suffering. But this abstracts away from the individuals and their relationships. So what we have is people and animals that become mere containers of pleasure or pain. If you can replace the container with one that holds more pleasure, for example, then for a utilitarian, this could see, be seen as the right thing to do. So utilitarianism is a view that wants to maximize pleasure, minimize pain by aggregating over a variety of different individuals. And 
part of the issue is that if what you're trying to do is maximize pleasure and minimize pain, then sometimes in a certain situation, some individuals will be replaceable. So what this means is that, for example, if you have a sad cow um, and you can replace that cow with a slightly happier cow, then you would be justified in ending the life of that sad cow to replace that cow with a cow that could produce more overall utility, more overall happiness. Now, this is thought by many to be a failure of the utilitarian view, which values individuals, again, not as themselves, but as containers of pleasure or pain. And this has led many animal advocates to opt for what we could call the animal rights view. The animal rights view um, is often associated with Peter Singer, but as I suggested Peter Singer is a utilitarian and animal rights isn't really an issue for utilitarians. Animal rights is a distinct view and it's a view that also is different from legal rights views. Animal rights views are moral views that are distinct from legal rights views. So let me just take a moment to explain the difference. Legal rights, of course, have to be recognized by law. Moral rights, on the other hand, exist prior to law. And the animal rights position is one that recognizes the rights of individual animals without necessarily having legal rights attached to them. Tom Reagan was probably the most prominent figure who developed a view of animal rights in his very important 1983 book, The Case for Animal Rights. In that book, he argues that animals are subjects of a life that the value of lives cannot be reduced to the amount of pleasure they contain. For Tom Reagan, the idea is that individuals are inherently valuable. They cannot be owned, used, killed, confined, or tortured to benefit others, even if they too might benefit. So the idea for the animal rights view is that you can't take the life of another or harm another simply if it leads to greater pleasure or happiness for some others. Animals have experiences that matter to them, and that mattering, the fact that they have these experiences that they value, gives them certain rights. Now, the rights view has recently been elaborated upon and further developed by Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson in their important 2013 book, Zoopolis. One of the advances that Kimlicka and Donaldson present us with is this division between different kinds of animals and our relationships to them. So we have domestic animals, liminal animals, and wild animals. Domestic animals we're familiar with, those are cats and dogs and other animals that live in our homes, but also farmed animals are domestic animals. These are animals that pretty much we control. Liminal animals are animals that we don't really control, but they live in our spaces, they live around us, they make their way through human activity. So these are animals like squirrels or raccoons, sparrows, pigeons, those sorts of animals. And then there are wild animals. Wild animals are animals that don't really have anything to do with humans or would like not to have to do with humans. However, because human activity is so ubiquitous across the globe, many wild animals often encounter humans and humans encounter wild animals. Now, part of what's interesting about having these three different types of context for thinking about animal rights is that within each context, Donaldson and Kimlicka let us know that there are different kinds of rights that each of these types of animals have. So for example, in the domestic sphere, the idea is that what we should be doing if animals have rights there is provide them with the ability to participate in our communities, to have a say, as it were, in what it is that we're doing, that they be members of our communities given that they live with us. With liminal animals, we might have certain certain kinds of limitations on what we can do to protect their rights. So exterminating um, liminal animals may be inappropriate as a way of respecting their rights. And wild animals are sovereign beings. And in this context, we should do our best not to interfere with their rights and their right to live their lives as they choose. One final book that I think is really important in the rights tradition is Christine Korsgaard's book, Fellow Creatures, a very powerful book that was published in 2018. In Chris Korsgaard's book, we get the sense from a Kantian perspective that 
What we owe our fellow creatures is their dignity, and they have this dignity because their lives matter to them. The problem with the rights view is that it fundamentally focuses on individual rights. Rights that are both legal and ethical are protections that individuals can use to prevent certain bad actions from happening to them. Or in the case of animals, perhaps you have a third party human who invokes the animal's rights in order to protect them. But it's primarily an individual based concern. But we are not simply individual actors bumping against each other as we make our ways through the world. One set of theories that focuses less on individuals and more on our relationships with others, both human and non-human, is the ethics of care. Josephine Donovan and Carol Adams developed a feminist ethics of care for thinking about other animals, primarily by focusing on our relationships and not on individual animals, their rights or their capacities or their ability to feel pleasure or pain. The ethics of care urges us to reflect more deeply on our relationships to animals and the way these relationships shape our conceptions of ourselves and our very agency. We, of course, in turn, shape those relationships. So there's more of a dynamic spirit to an ethics of care than maybe some of the other ethical theories. I developed a type of ethics of care that I call entangled empathy, in which we direct our attention to specific others in their particular circumstances. And what we try to do is understand what they're up against while respectfully responding to their conditions. Even though we're limited by our inevitable anthropocentric perspective, being in respectful ethical relations involves in part attempting to understand and respond to another's needs, interests, desires, vulnerabilities, hopes, and perspectives. Entangled empathy is a process that involves both affect and cognition, both feeling and thought. And instead of just stepping into the shoes of another, what entangled empathy requires is that we both look at the other, try to discover what's going on from their point of view, then step back and figure out where we are vis-a-vis -vis their point of view, and go back and forth between the first person and the third person perspective. This is really important to avoid projecting our own views on others, particularly others that can't talk back. Just as there are criticisms of other moral theories, utilitarianism and rights-based theories, I know there are concerns about the ethics of care and entangled empathy, but I'll leave it to you to think of what those concerns might be. So I've presented you with three moral theories. There are other moral theories. But the three I presented, utilitarianism is an amalgamation, a theory that takes into account the suffering and the pleasure of all beings, humans and non-humans, but it aggregates it all. The rights theory, which focuses on individuals and their rights and the claims that they can make against one another. And finally, an ethics of care, which focuses fundamentally on relationships. All of these theories help to guide our action and shape our policy, but they also all have particular weaknesses. In this presentation, I've described the various normative systems that help us determine what's right and what's wrong, systems that are useful in various contexts. I focused primarily on ethics, that's my area of expertise, and suggested where there were overlaps with the law. I then described how we can figure out who matters, that is, who we should be paying moral attention to in our deliberations. I suggested that focusing on sameness has some problems and that we must start appreciating differences and the wonderful ways that animals make their way in the world. Finally, I described three types of ethical theories that can help guide our actions and shape our policies, utilitarianism, rights theory, and an ethic of care. I hope that this discussion will help you think differently, not just about other animals, but how we might value them as themselves, not only through a human-centered, anthropocentric lens. This sort of alternative way of valuing may help us all live more ethical lives. We need to think more deeply about other animals and about their wonderful differences and treat them with dignity to begin to see them and value them for the unique beings that they are. This will make all of our relationships near and far better and more meaningful. For Animal Law Fundamentals, I'm Lori Gruen. <laughs>